In the realms of Dungeons and Dragons, magic can tear the world itself asunder. But more often than not, it just causes arguments at the game table. <laughs> We're looking at five game-breaking spells in D&D 5e. And how to handle them. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today we're taking a look at five spells that we think might be game-breaking in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. How often has this happened at your game table? A player says that they are casting a spell which has never been seen before at your table. The Dungeon Master quickly flips through the pages of the player's handbook, and their eyes widen in horror at what the spell can do. It will completely shut down the encounter, or perhaps even derail rail the narrative entirely. It's a game-breaking spell. Now, we're not looking at high-level spells here because pretty much every spell that's 7th, 8th, and ninth level mm -hmm. could be listed as game-breaking. But what we want to focus on are some of the lower-level spells that when you actually read the rules text, you go, oh man, there's a lot of possibilities here that can really change the way the game is working. Yeah, and that's why it's worth thinking about these spells in advance, because the truth of the matter is, is that none of them are so powerful, in our opinions, that they actually need to be removed from the game or banned from your table. But they do require a clear understanding of exactly what the rules say that the spells are capable of doing, and a little bit of preparedness on the part of the dungeon master and the players so that you all know what to expect when these spells happen in your game. So, let's get casting. So the first spell that we are going to look at today is Phantasmal Force. Phantasmal Force is a second level illusion spell, and if you're following along, it's on page 264 of your player's handbook. It has a casting time of one action, and it lasts for one minute, requiring the caster's concentration. This really unique spell has a lot of open-ended effects. You choose a target that you can see within 60 feet of you, and you create an illusionary... Uh, phantasm in their minds that only they can see if they fail an intelligence saving throw. The phantasm can be no larger than 10 feet on any given side, and it lasts as long as you concentrate on it. It can really be anything of your imagination. And this has prompted some very creative players to come up with lots of different ideas for what this spell could create in the mind of the creature that is, uh, is afflicted by it. One of the most potent elements of this spell is that the creature rationalizes any illogical consistencies that come from interacting with the phantasm uh, so that it continues to believe that it's real. In fact, the only way a creature can break out of the spell once it's in effect is by spending its action to make an intelligence investigation check against your spell saving throw DC. You don't have to, to go very far to realize that this is a very difficult spell to escape from once it's, you're afflicted by it, but what it can actually cause is subject to a lot of interpretation. The example used in the description, uh, just to highlight what you've said, is creating a bridge across a chasm. And if a character decides to try to cross that bridge and they fall, they will just chalk it up to, I must have slipped, a wind must have blown me off, and they will climb up and potentially try crossing that bridge again. You can create anything you can imagine with this phantasm, but there's a few really important things to keep in mind that many players and dungeon masters forget. Phantasmal Force, like many illusion spells, can actually not be changed once the illusion is in effect. That is a specific ability that the spell needs to say or you need to be a wizard illusionist of high enough level to have the ability to change your illusions. Once you've declared what the Phantasmal Force is, it just goes off on its program sequence. So for all you wizards out there hoping to cast this spell and then manipulate it from turn to turn, you're not going to be able to do that. Once you've set out those commands, that's it. Speaking of being able to manipulate the image, the image that you create, the Phantasm, is actually created in a point in space in the creature's mind and it's locked in that space. Nothing in the spell description indicates that once you create the illusory phantasm, that it can actually move around from the space that it's been created. So bear that in mind when you're creating these images. If you want to create an image that is of something that might follow the target creature around or actually be on its person, it seems to imply that it can't be moved around after it's in place. It also says within the rule that you can create a creature that can attack and harm an opponent. 
However, given the rules that there's no movement, that means that if your enemy decides to move away from that creature, that creature is just going to stand there and stare at them because it can't actually move around or do further attacks unless the enemy is within five feet of it. This is the key indicator that the, the phantasm created by phantasmal force um, cannot move because the spell specifically calls out the fact that the creature has to be within five feet of the phantasm to be able to be damaged by it. I've run into many players that have looked at Phantasmal Force and their immediate impulse is to create some sort of illusion like a set of chains or a bucket or something that will restrain or blind the creature. It's up to you as a dungeon master if the spell can do this. However, I recommend exercising caution with interpretations of the spell that let it behave like much more powerful spells. Uh, Phantasmal Force isn't Hold Person, it's not Hold Monster, or my favorite example is it's not like the 6th level spell Mental Prison from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. If the player is looking f to create an effect that will restrain a creature, or will blind them, or prevent them from acting in some way, I feel that Phantasmal Force isn't the spell that should be used to accomplish that, and that rather the player should be looking for a spell that has a more hard description that does that effect. What I think Phantasmal Force is great for is to impose some sort of um, momentary advantage within a close quarters combat. If you're being chased down a hallway by some enemies and you put a pool of lava between you and them, that's going to give you a little bit of time mm. to deal with that situation uh, without having to worry so much about them catching up to you right away. Same idea goes for escapes, if you can you do something to diverge their attention, or little things like that, rather than focusing on using it as a like encounter-ending spell. Yeah, one of my favorite ideas that we discussed was the ability to create a phantasmal door that could not be opened. The creature just rationalizing, oh, this doorknob must be really slippery. I can't open it up. That seems to me to be a perfectly valid use of the spell. And I really like the creative applications for Phantasmal Force that rely on creating objects in the environment, um, like pits of acid or lava or false bridges and doors that will confuse a creature, but not necessarily try to be like this magical force trying to restrain them. When in doubt, Phantasmal Force is a spell that I feel that if a player has a specific strategy in mind, you should really talk to your dungeon master about it rather than springing on them in the middle of a combat encounter, because that can really slow the game down as the two of you argue back and forth about how to interpret the illogical outcomes of Phantasmal Force. The second spell that we are looking at today is Suggestion. Suggestion is a second level enchantment spell. It's available to bards, sorcerers, wizards, and warlocks alike, as well as arcane trickster rogues. Yeah, and it can be found on page 279 of the Player's Handbook. Just as before, it is a concentration spell that requires only one action to cast, and it lasts for up to eight hours. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty incredible. It's an all-time favorite of, I think, both of us. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know many people who don't love using Suggestion. The, the idea of Suggestion is that you can speak a small sentence or two and give an order to a creature, and if they fail their wisdom saving throw, they then have to... Um, execute the commands that were given to them as best as they can. But you cannot put them in harm's way. Yeah, you can't give them an unreasonable suggestion. One that would, for example, ask them to throw themselves on their sword or throw themselves off a cliff or harm a loved one or do something that is against their very nature, like asking a king to give up their kingdom or the big bad evil sorceress to give up her plans for world domination. <laughs> Yes, but within the text are a lot of things that if you use your imagination, you'll find really cool ways to kind of exploit and change the battlefield and the way that things are going in your game. This is also a phenomenal spell to use in social situations, not necessarily just combat. And I think for me personally, the use of the suggestion spell is far more potent in a social situation or an exploration scenario than it necessarily is in combat. Um, the, although there's still a lot of options within all of these. One of the things though to clarify right away with the suggestion spell is a commonly asked question in Sage Advice. Is the verbalization of the suggestion, the actual sentence that you speak, the verbal component for 
suggestion. It is not. It is not. So you actually utter a bunch of arcane babble and then say your suggestion. They're not combined into one. And very often it gets role-played this way as a way of kind of being a smooth operator in a social situation where the bard is uttering some honeyed words and hopes to sneak in a suggestion. But again, as always, the evidence of arcane spellcasting will uh, out you that you're doing that. So unless you're a sorcerer with the subtle spell meta magic, <laughs> which is a really cool way of casting suggestion, other observers will see that you magicked somebody up and they might think that you bewitched them. Suggestion may not have a place in certain tense social situations because of the verbal component necessary. Everybody's going to notice the spellcaster speaking the words to cast the spell. So if all the town guards are standing there with their hands ready at their swords and see you starting to cast suggestion before even giving the commands, they'll notice and they might draw their swords on you. That's not to say that they know what spell that you're casting, but I think that most NPCs in the worlds of Dungeons & Dragons are savvy enough to know that if they hear a bunch of arcane mumbo-jumbo and all of a sudden their friend starts acting strangely, something might be up. What are some useful suggestions? Maybe you are confronted with the town guard and their captain is in the front ranks and you cast suggestion and say, we are not your enemies, call your men off. Maybe you're in the middle of combat, you don't want to be fighting somebody, and already the spells are starting to get slung around, and you cast on the leader of the enemy troops and say, hey, let's let's talk about this for a moment. Put down your arms. That could be a viable use of the spell. I think one of the more problematic ones, though, is using it suggestion as an interrogation tactic, because this one is overwhelmingly effective. You simply suggest, I don't want to hurt you. Answer all of my questions truthfully and honestly. Magic truth serum. It's zone of truth and persuasion all in one. Given the circumstances, depending on your relationship to whoever you're interrogating, whoever you're trying to ask questions to, this is not necessarily an unreasonable request. And because the spell lasts for eight hours, you can pump somebody for a bunch of questions and get a lot of answers out of them. Um, If they know that by revealing this information, whoever they work for is will almost certainly kill them, That I think that that's a reasonable point where the suggestion spell would simply fail. Another simple one is if you're confronted with a single enemy, just suggesting that they walk north for eight hours. See you later. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite ideas is, no, you can't directly uh, suggest somebody harm themselves, but to have them stay put while you climb a cliff and roll a boulder onto them, if they don't know the boulder's there and they have no idea what you're up to, Who's to say that's a bad idea? I actually have this mental image of asking a giant to sit down while you wheel up like a giant crossbow. Again, these things start to get into borderline mind control. And I think one of the things to remember with suggestion is that ultimately it is like a Jedi mind trick. It's like a quick command, not necessarily something that's going to get them to reevaluate their entire life and give up all their life goals. These aren't the droids you're looking for. Move along. Reasonable suggestion. He didn't say... Call off all of the stormtroopers in this area and fly back home. That would have been too much. Yeah, so remember that suggestion has reasonable limitations to it. It does need to be an immediate course of action, and when it gets used in game-breaking ways, that's often when the suggestion is way, way more than what can be simply accomplished. And I find that, again, this is the case where you want to talk about expectations, Uh, and manage them very, very carefully so that the players aren't disappointed when they have a really cool idea for using suggestion only for you as the dungeon master to be like, if I let this fly, it's going to snap everything in half that I planned. The third spell we're going to look at today is Arcane Eye. I love Arcane Eye. I know you do. Why do I love game-breaking spells? Because you've been playing D&D a very long time and you know what they (laughs) are and how to use them. That's true. Arcane Eye is a fourth level divination spell. It's available to wizards exclusively as well as clerics of the Knowledge and Arcana domain. You can find the full spell description on page 214 of the Player's Handbook. It requires only one action to cast and requires your concentration for up to one hour of duration. And it creates an invisible eye that has dark vision that you can basically just fly around and scout out places with. Arcane Eye is often used similarly to the way that wizards will use their familiar to scout a location. 
by perceiving the world through the familiar senses. The advantage that Arcane Eye offers is that it can go at a much further range than your familiar, who's only limited to usually a range of about 100 feet. Um, and the fact that the Arcane Eye is an invisible divination sensor that is only one inch uh, in diameter, which enables it to get into spaces that your familiar would not be able to get to. And I can sum up why this spell is so powerful with one little story that happened at our game table when Monty was playing at my table as a wizard. They had just gained the ability to cast fourth level spells, and I presented them with a dungeon that had guards standing in front of it, and it was a cave. Within this cave was a a network of passages, none of which had doors on them, and no creature inside had the ability to see invisible creatures or anything of the sort. We were low enough level that there was nothing really powerful within that area, but it was a cave jam-packed with uh, treasure rooms and different creatures roaming different hallways and different ways that they could go. Monty simply cast Arcane Eye, flew it right past the guards, and navigated the entire dungeon, relaying all the information so that I basically could just hand them the map, tell them where everything was, and they were able to plan their attack. It was still a really fun session, but let me tell you as a DM, it definitely changed the way I was planning to run that night. Of course, it's possible to circumvent all of this by having a good set of double doors on the front of your dungeon, Um, but Arcane Eye should still be something that is in the back of your mind as a dungeon master if you do have a wizard in your party. It's a very effective scouting method, and even if you're not scouting a dungeon, if you're scouting an above-ground location such as a castle or a prison or any environment with windows where the player can be patient and wait for doors to open and close, there's no risk to them until the sensor is detected. Of course, there is a one way to shut the spell down entirely if it is going to be a problem, and that is warding the area with a spell like Mordenkainen's Private Sanctum or Forbiddance, which does prevent the Arcane Eye from entering the warded area. So you do have that option in your back pocket if you need a world-building construct for protecting the world. Also, the Arcane Eye does not relay... um audio interpretations, only visual, so you Mm -hmm. can't hear what's going on. So there are ways that you can make it so your character can read lips, and that might be a cool thing to combine with Arcane Eye if you really want to be the scout for your party. Yeah, but it's not necessarily the perfect way to eavesdrop on an enemy's plans, because again, it only uh, sends back that visual information. And I am often surprised at how many people miss this point, Uh, Because I have played at tables where all of a sudden the DM just starts recanting the enemy's plans. I'm like, "Uh, you you realize Arcane Eye doesn't let you hear. The other thing to remember with Arcane Eye is that creatures that are protected by spells like Mind Blank or um, Non-Detection are invisible to the sensor. The fourth spell that we are going to look at today is an all-time favorite of both Monty and I, and that is the one, the only, Polymorph. Polymorph. Polymorph is a fourth level transmutation spell, and it's found on page 266 of your player's handbook. It's available to a wide range of classes, including the Bard, the Druid, the Wizard, the Sorcerer, as well as Trickery Domain Clerics, making it a highly accessible spell and one that's very likely to find its way into many adventuring parties. Yeah, the spell basically lets you turn either a friend or foe into another beast. This is a very specific requirement of the spell. The creature that you target, which could even be yourself, actually, can be transformed into any creature that is a beast, and beasts only, uh, with a challenge rating equal to either its character level or its own challenge rating in the case of NPCs and monsters. This means that a 8th level player character can be transformed into a challenge rating 8 beast, such as the mighty Tyrannosaurus Rex. This also means that you can transform virtually anyone into a harmless bunny rabbit, frog, slug, sheep, goat, or anything else that your imagination comes up with. As long as it's a beast, of course. Because Polymorph is so versatile, you can target yourself, you can target another player character, you can target a non-player character or an adversary that you're fighting. It can be used in combat, 
It can be used to aid your exploration, for instance, by transforming into a giant eagle to fly your party across the desert. Or it can be used offensively in combat as battlefield control or as a mighty buff spell by turning a friendly uh, member of your party into a monstrous creature. Don't forget it can also be used for infiltration if you turn yourself into something very small to sneak into hard to reach areas. This phenomenally versatile spell basically opens up the druid's wild shape to almost everybody. One thing to keep in mind when you have a polymorph creature is that they maintain their personality, memory, and alignment. They remember who their friends are and they understand who their foes are, even though their intelligence might be greatly diminished by the form of the new beast they take on, they can still concentrate on a spell they had in place before becoming the polymorph creature. Once they are transformed, their game statistics are completely replaced by the statistics of the creature they become. They lose basically everything you just open up to the monster manu manual and choose the stat block. And if you cast Polymorph on yourself, remember that you do have to maintain concentration on that. So this also means that if you are hit, even in Polymorph form, you do have to make concentration checks. Often without the benefit of your higher constitution score or feats like Warcaster, which go away when you're Polymorphed, which is different from when you use Wild Shape. You don't become a feral creature or an NPC in control of the DM. You're fully in control of your own actions and I believe that there's no way to rule that the intelligence that you possess as a polymorph creature is in any way that much different from a domesticated or trained animal. Yeah, think of it as a well-trained dog. Follows orders, you can give it commands, it may not understand your language, but dogs are capable of learning simple commands and performing tasks. And oftentimes there's guard dogs, there's dogs that like have fought in battles. Just think of it like that, and that's basically the baseline for Polymorph. I feel that if the spell was meant for you to lose control of your character in some way, if you were meant to become feral, it would probably say that in the description of the spell. But lacking that, we can only assume that you retain full control of your actions. And so the next component of this then is the diverse array of creatures that you can become with Polymorph including some which might be campaign setting dependent. And I think this is the biggest thing to talk about in your group before someone says, I want to polymorph into a T-Rex. And the DM's like, you can't. There's no T-Rexes in my campaign world. Yeah, and that is the one thing is uh, some people I've heard um, house rule this idea that you can only polymorph into a creature that you have mm. seen, um, which then nullifies often the T-Rex as an option. Um, nowhere in the actual rules of the spell does it say this. It just says you can turn into any beast. Yeah. Uh, the T-Rex is my personal favorite choice, but talk to your DM about whether or not they will allow that. Yeah, and even though oftentimes people have a knee-jerk reaction to the polymorphing into the T-Rex, it is admittedly a powerful form. It's by no means the most powerful nor the most problematic. The challenge rating 7 giant ape deals almost as much damage, is as almost resilient, and doesn't come with the baggage associate that people associate with the T-Rex, because oftentimes people are like, the T-Rex is a feral carnivore, it's going to eat your party, it only has a low intelligence score. Well, the giant ape is, a, is an omnivore, it has an intelligence of seven. So it's a pretty good form that addresses a lot of those concerns, and it might be more common, depending on your campaign world, for a giant ape to exist than a T-Rex. Again, this is all DM dependent, so make sure that you do clearly discuss this with your DM about what forms are available. If you're going to have any of these additional restrictions, make sure it's on the table so everyone understands that. And as for problem solving, we mentioned it earlier, but the giant eagle is also just a great choice for transportation for basically the entire party. If you have a small enough party, they mm -hmm. can all fit on the giant eagle's back and fly around. I feel like Polymorph is completely above the curve for a fourth level spell. I think if it was a sixth level spell, it would still be worth taking. Yeah. I don't think there's ever been a cooler moment than the Barbarian hopping on the T-Rex's back and riding into battle against a dragon. That's one of the coolest things that I can yeah, ever imagine. Yeah. So It was a really memorable moment. Sometimes so, yeah. you just gotta go with it. So Monty, what if I wanted to turn into an ant, crawl inside of the villain's head, and then change back and blow their head up. <laughs> I love this. Okay, so there's a lot of cases in D&D &D where a spell like Polymorph 
enables you to enter inside another creature and then violently burst forth a la aliens. Um, at least that's the image that players have in their mind. Um, and I think that whenever this occurs as a, as a DM, your first response can always be, no, you're magically shunted to the closest available space that can fit your new form and no damage is caused. I think that if Polymorph were meant to cause such a violent damage dealing capacity in that way, I mean, I could see it happening. It, it's just the, the issue with it is that that's such a reproducible strategy. Yeah. Right. And then you're basically turning Polymorph now into power word kill. The, the problems emerge when players try to get spells to do things that are too strong for their individual level that basically turn one spell like Polymorph that's an amazing utility spell and now all of a sudden it's power word kill. No, that doesn't work. You're safely shunted outside the other creature. The last spell we're going to look at today is Conjure Woodland Beings. And this one has some hidden gems in it. It does indeed. Conjure Woodland Beings is a fourth level conjuration spell, which is available to druids, rangers, and is a jaw-droppingly popular pick for bards to choose as their magical secret. Uh, it's found on page 226 of the player's handbook. It requires one action to cast, and you can concentrate on it for up to one hour. You basically summon a bunch of creatures from the Fae, and you get to choose the CR rating of the creatures you would like to summon, and they show up and they help you out in combat. So the most popular question with the Conjure Woodland Beings spells, and many other Conjuration spells, is does the player get to choose what creatures appear? And the official answer from Sage Advice is no. The player gets to choose what challenge rating of category of creatures appear. So in the case of Conjure Woodland Beings, your choice as a player is to get one challenge rating two fey creature, a pair of challenge rating one creatures, four challenge rating one half creatures, or eight challenge rating one quarter creatures. I really like this clarification from Sage Advice because prior to that, there was the assumption that the players got to choose the creatures that showed up which meant that most players were going to choose eight pixies. Pixies can cast fly and polymorph. So if you want four flying T-Rexes, pixies can do that. Your army of eight pixies would show up, cast polymorph on the four members of the party. Then the other four pixies would cast fly on the T-Rexes. And you have the most insane Jurassic World gone wrong imaginable. It's effectively doubling the number of fourth and third level spell slots that a druid or ranger can cast and offloading the burden of concentration on all of those spells to the pixies. The blink dogs are fantastic combatants. Um, the sprites, the alternative to the pixies, yeah. um, have a ranged attack that causes unconsciousness on a failed saving throw. Creatures like the sea hag, which has a horrific visage that can reduce creatures instantly to zero hit points. Yeah, I mean, you only get one sea hag, so the chances of that are small, but imagine just summoning that sea hag and having somebody fail their save and, oh, they're dead. Yeah, so the monsters that you can get with this spell are capable of dealing a lot of damage. Um, and offer tremendous utility. The thing that also, the, the quicklings deal a ton of damage too. Yeah, they just run out and stab, yeah. stab, stab. They have such quick movement. They can do all of these. They're small attacks, but they can get a lot of them in. The player can certainly express their preference, but I, I do think the army of pixies is pretty unreasonable. Um, but most of the other fey creatures, I don't have a problem with. With like for the most part, with the other conjure spells like uh, conjure animals uh, and conjure elementals. I don't find them to be so problematic. No, I think the only game-breaking aspect is a room of flying T-Rexes is literally the most dangerous scenario I can think of. Yeah. Everything else within this spell is really, really cool, but not necessarily going to, to ruin anything. Uh, but, but this is a case where I, I do think that if you are a player and you're using spells like Conjure Woodland Beings, it's on you to be ready with the monster statistics please don't be the player that reads the spell for the first time and doesn't know what you can summon with it and then now has to spend 10 minutes reading all the monster manual entries at the table in the middle of the game deciding what you'd like to conjure up. Yeah. When, I, when I got Shay into D&D, &D, she, uh, she took polymorph, polymorph as a spell and I actually printed out 
basically a booklet for her of yeah. all the things that I recommended her being able to turn into so that when she did want to cast the spell, she could just flip through and find the appropriate creature to change into. So really with these five spells that we've looked at today, uh, we say game breaking, but we don't mean that they should be removed from the game or that they are in any way unfair to the game. It's just that there's a lot of little hidden secrets in the context of these spells that can be used in very, very interesting ways that can really be more effective than a first glance at that spell. This is by no means an exhaustive list of all the spells with surprising implications um, that can catch a DM unprepared. If your intent as a player is to abuse the game and its rules, as a DM, I'm not going to be on your side. But if you're going to come with creativity, an open mind, and an interest in contributing to a memorable and fun game experience, I'm totally willing to work with you on, on that. I think a lot of people like pour through the player's handbook and are excited about the ways that they're going to derail the campaign. Um, and to me, that that's being a poor sport. Coming together as a group, just acknowledging, hey, we know these spells have problems. We agree as a metagame pact between all of us, we're not going to use these spells in these ways but ones that are closer to the spirit of the game itself and fostering a positive and creative environment. At the end of the day, the DM has the final say in how to interpret these rules. So when it comes down to it, once the DM makes a decision on how these spells are going to be used in the game, don't spend 20 minutes arguing with them about it. Just go with the flow and figure out the mm. best way to move forward. Yeah, the spirit of the rules is far more important than adhering to the letter of the rules especially in these cases where the rules actually are a little bit of a gap. <laughs> yeah, the, the text leaves a lot of openings for interpretation, which is both the pro and the con to these spells. And that's why we play role-playing games, because we want to have creative impetus for awesome role-playing and interesting action-packed sequences, and not necessarily the shackles that we have on us in video games, where you can't do creative things like these at all. So this has been our look at five game-breaking spells in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. We hope that you feel inspired to find new and unique ways to use these spells at your table. And of course, we would love to know of any other spells that you might be having trouble with in your games in the comments below. We'd love to have a chat and share with you our ideas and feedback about how to deal with some of the other spells, and there are many more, that create difficult situations in interpretation at the table. You can watch Monty and I play D&D Live in our new campaign, Dungeons of Drakenheim, on Twitch.tv. The campaign airs every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Kelly and I are joined by our good friends Joe and Jill, and I'll be running a campaign where they'll be delving into the ruins of a dangerous, ruined fantasy city. Check it out by following the links right below. Now, we talked a lot about spellcasting in this episode, so if you want to learn more about spells and spellcasting, we have an episode on that right up over here. And if you want to turn the tables on your players, check out our guide to five spells for villains right over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.